Hello, everyone. Today marks the beginning of the first weekend of the Disney Lorcana Set Championships. In fact, the first events have already taken place today, so it seems like a good time to talk about all the decks you'll be seeing at your local game stores over the next two weeks during all of the action. In this video, I'll be covering the top 10 decks that have already begun to show up in force for the events. My hope is that this video provides some ideas for anyone still on the fence of what they want to play, while also covering all the details about the spread of the competition. After all, there's a huge variety of strong decks right now in the Lorcana meta, so we're going to jump into the details of all the decks right now. I'm going to start by covering some of the very top decks available in Lorcana, and then move on to some secondary meta threats that all have some upset potential. The ranking of the decks today isn't all that important, as each deck has tools to take down the other lists, with some matchups being quite circular. Regardless, these are my top deck lists going into the events, mixed with some top contender information from tournaments that happened on day one. So let's get started. We're going to begin with Ruby Amethyst, everyone's favorite bounce control deck. We've seen it dominate since set one, and even though it has some incredible competition these days, it's still an extremely solid pick. In fact, I think Ruby Amethyst has sort of become the neutral pick in the meta. Even with its weaknesses, which I'll cover soon, it has a huge variety of tools available to fight back against other meta decks. I'm sure everyone is all too familiar, but this deck strategy utilizes the incredibly valuable Amethyst core, creating card advantage with Maleficent, Rabbit, and Friends on the other side, all drawing cards. The first two are also able to sing Friends for maximum value, but can also be bounced back to hand with Madam Mims for repeated use. Merlin Goat is also here, ready to close out games with his bouncing lore potential. All that Amethyst goodness is supported by powerful Ruby cards that seek to control the board as you enact your bouncing game plan. Between Maui and Be Prepared specifically, these two Ruby cards alone allow the deck to respond to almost any threat, whether it be a full board of characters or strong locations like the Queen's Castle or McDuck Manor. Now I did say almost any threat because a major weakness of Ruby Amethyst is its inability to take out items. This major blind spot leaves room for spellbooks, lucky dimes, and even flutes and lanterns to run amok in the matchup. So definitely look out for that if you're playing this deck. My list here is fairly standard, but showcases a few tech options to consider, namely Teeth and Ambitions and Surfer Mini. Mini was absent for a long time, but has become more popular over the last few weeks to help fight the tough Ruby Sapphire matchup, as well as being annoying in the Ruby Amethyst Mirror match. That said, I'm not a huge advocate for her inclusion, as I don't think she changes the outcome of those matchups all too much, and I'd rather aim strongly towards this deck's main game plan rather than tech into one deck in a huge field of threats. If you really like the idea of Mini, maybe just add two copies of her like I show here, but you might be better off maxing out your card draw tools like Maleficent Sorceress and Cusco for maximum consistency. Teeth and Ambitions is another tech option used to slow down aggressive green decks and amber steel song decks. Merfolk, Flynn, Cinderella, and even the Queen and Robin Hood are all great targets here. I think Teeth is also a flexible card in the deck for sure, but worth considering if you predict a surge in those threats at your event. If you don't predict much steel, take them out and even consider swapping Olaf for Chernobog's followers for more card draw. If you're still worried about the growing emerald threat, you do have Pinocchio as a very strong tool for taking down those Ursulas. Don't underestimate his utility in this deck, even into the late game. For some final considerations, Dragon is always an option as a big top-end threat, while Scar sometimes finds his way in to support Maui with another rush keyword. Speaking of Maui, his fish hook can also help bust locations or evasives, and another great item is the Sorcerer's Spellbook. It's particularly deadly when playing in a Ruby Amethyst mirror match. And finally, I think Jim Hawkins is a spicy pick that can really catch players off guard going into turn five, comboing with those castles, of course. Now, if you're looking to play Ruby Amethyst, don't stress too much about the list and all those different options. This deck has such a solid core of around 50 cards or so, and all those final additions really come down to personal preference and comfort. But enough of red purple, let's move on to our next deck. Let's keep it going with Ruby though, this time with Ruby Sapphire Dime Control. 
When Lorcana set 3 first dropped, I was spamming red blue so much in that first week, specifically a heavy location focused list, but it wasn't long before Lucky Dime rose up to become the dominant force of this deck. Similar to the Ruby Amethyst list we just covered, this is a control style deck with Ruby removal. Again, utilizing two of the best cards in the game with Maui and Be Prepared, along with Tremaine, Medusa, Scar, and Maleficent Dragon, all looking to lock down the board. The addition of Sapphire unlocks all this potential with its Ink Well ramp, allowing the deck to quickly arrive at those strong double digit ink numbers. Comparing the two Ruby decks, they both want to control the game in this way, but the late game threats of Tamatoa and Bell, combined with Lucky Dime, allow Sapphire to close out matches with an extra push for lore at the end. This is surprisingly similar to the Amethyst Merlin Goat Bounce to finish out games, but the playstyles are very different in practice, with Sapphire leaning heavily into its early Fishbone for ramp and utilizing Hiram to draw cards off popsicles and other items. Shown here is my recommended list for anyone looking to try out this deck. It's somewhat standard, but includes some new ideas, mainly my choice to go all in on Medusa rather than Tremaine, and the inclusion of how far I'll go. It's been working really well for me. I've cut back on the early Queen of Hearts in favor of a rapid ink plan. One jump ahead on turn two into turn three card draw with Hiram, Gramatala, or the additional draw and ramp with how far I'll go. The goal of all this ink, ramp, and card draw is to set you up for success going into the mid game, even against some aggro matchups. This list definitely pushes the limits of the uninkable count in this deck, and because of that, you do have to settle for only two copies of Scar and Gaston, but both are very strong picks. One helps you scout out all those crucial pieces you need, and the other backs up Maui as a secondary rush threat. In addition to all this, there are a couple other good choices to consider though. Maui's fish hook can help with evasives or locations, or you can splash in a location yourself with a couple copies of McDuck Manor. Lady Tremaine is of course another strong pick, but I think Madame Medusa is just strictly better right now. She takes down so many threats single-handedly. Beyond these three options though, I wouldn't suggest changing all too much in this deck list. It's not as flexible as it might seem. The deck requires really smooth generation of both ink and card draw to really get going, and this is why there are so many scouting cards like Develop Your Brain, Grandma Tala, and How Far I'll Go. They're a major part of the plan here. So other than those few considerations I mentioned, this is pretty much the core of the deck right here. Now for some reason, I still see a lot of Ruby Sapphire lists with some wacky choices like Heart of Tefiti, which has never been a good choice in my experience. Some lists even go super deep into other items, maxing out Shield of Virtue or even Scepter of Arendelle, which is unnecessary. That being said, it's definitely worth testing out these options for yourself. Overall, this deck is the one for you if you like a controlled playstyle, and it certainly has the ability to shut down steel combo decks, and even Ruby Amethyst if your dime finisher comes down before their flood of goats. Now, Ruby Sapphire doesn't come without any major weaknesses. As mentioned, Emerald can be a pain for this deck, both Emerald Amethyst and Emerald Steel Discard, and we'll look at those two decks soon enough. But another major issue to look at with this list is time. Set Championships is being played on a best of three format, so the clock is perhaps the biggest problem for this dime control deck. If this list continues to show up in abundance, those mirror matches are going to be a slog to get through, reminiscent of the set one days of brooms and magic mirrors. But despite that drawback, this deck is certainly a blast to play, and I suspect it'll be very popular, so make sure you look out for it this weekend. Next, let's swap over to some new colors and talk about Amber Steel. I'll go through each current version of the classic Steel Song list, covering the flutes versus lanterns variations, for example. But for now, let's start with the four flutes version of Steel Song. This deck is all about getting ahead of the opponent with super valuable combos that come from playing songs out for free by singing. The plan revolves around wanting to get out a turn three aerial spectacular singer. She can sing Grab Your Sword and then Along Came Zeus, world's greatest criminal mind, and most importantly, a whole new world. Early Floodborne shifts with the Queen or Robin Hood can also sing these four and five cost songs, or they can join an early Cinderella ballroom sensation in singing early game songs like Bare Necessities, Let the Storm Rage On, and Strength Like a Raging Fire. 
These two and three cost songs are very strong and are one of the major reasons to run this list, as they can really oppress the opponent's game plan. Whether that be shutting down their early items or songs of their own with bare necessities, or by clearing out their pesky characters with consistent targeted damage from Storm and Strength. With all these songs, we see combos emerging right away, with an early game lockdown leading into a whole new world to reset hands, effectively refilling your quiver of threatening action. This deck can really pull ahead with constant pressure raining down, and if the combo pieces line up just right, it's a true force to behold, simply running away with the victory. You can see why the Flutes version of this deck can be so effective, as Flutes allow you to gain lore each turn a song is played. After a couple of Flutes hit the table, it's only a matter of turns before Lethal is in sight. A few things to note about my list here, I love adding in Mr. Smee. His self-damage is a natural pairing with Rapunzel, and he adds some flexibility in the early game, whether it be questing early or providing his solid 3 strength right from turn 2. I'm also a big fan of running two copies of World's Greatest Criminal Mind, which I think is a bit unusual, but it's absolutely vital against Ruby and Sapphire threats like Maleficent Dragon, Tamatoa, and even Maui. I suppose it also helps against rival Cinderella's in the mirror match, but the main use is really to fight back against Red Blue, which is the major counter to Amber Steel. Now with all that out of the way, let's swap to the Lanterns version of this deck, which I think is a bit stronger in general against most matchups, with the exclusion potentially being Ruby Amethyst, which I like flutes into more. That being said, this Lanterns list here is overall more effective at getting ahead of the opponent's game plan, and although the list doesn't change too much, the addition of Lanterns is very noticeable, allowing 5 cost characters to come out early, even without their shift targets. The extra tempo from Lanterns also allows Cinderella to shift in early, and invites Surfer Stitch to join the party. And although you might miss some combo-heavy goodness from the flutes, Lanterns add even more tempo to this deck that already relies on great turn-to-turn -turn impact. For example, another major bonus of Lanterns is that they make it a lot easier to place out multiple characters on the same turn, which is a great option against Ruby in particular. After a board wipe, it's going to be much harder for your opponent to get off a strong Tremaine play if you can drop down two characters as a follow-up. If you want even more mid-game threats in this deck, you could bump up the list past 60 for a couple sad beasts, or simply take out a few songs to make room. After all, the songs are very strong, but they are the slightest bit less necessary if you aren't on flutes. That said, I do struggle to cut Grab Your Sword or And Then Along Came Zeus down below two copies, and I think the three cost damage songs need to stay at a count of three or four. Because of that, and my general hesitancy to push past a 60 card limit, I've opted to leave out Beast Tragic Hero this time around. Now let's discuss the third Steel Song variant, Amber Steel Pride Lands. This one has been getting some recent attention, and it'll probably be played at some of the events, although I do think it's the weakest of the three Amber Steel lists. Pride Lands comes out on turn two as a location threat with seven willpower. Seven that early on can be difficult to clear out, but another use of Pride Lands is to give your characters a boost to their willpower. This works really nicely along with Rapunzel, as that extra health offers more opportunity for your characters to challenge in for that soon to be healed off damage. Pride Lands is definitely interesting, no doubt, but now that the surprise factor has worn off a bit, it still seems a bit weak to Maui and Madame Mim Fox, even with that early 7 willpower. If it were an inkable location, it would be a much easier inclusion in potentially every version of Steel Song, but for now it's going to be a choice whether to run it over flutes or lanterns, as the deck is already packed to the brim with uninkables. Overall, Steel Song decks are in a good spot, but certainly still live in that rock, paper, scissors realm, helping take down some aggressive emerald decks, but suffering against some sapphire decks that can keep them in check. Alright, well up next let's talk about Emerald Steel Discard, one of the more divisive decks to rise up in the meta this set. Winning due to card advantage is one thing, but winning due to the inability of the opponent to play even a single card from their hand is really where it's at. At least that seems to be the opinion of discard enjoyers. 
Now, one reason to pilot this deck is that although it does have some weaknesses, such as against Sapphire Steel and Amber Steel, in general, Discard can do a decent job at beating up the broader format if given the chance. With Cursed Merfolk on turn one into Flynn Rider on turn two, the aggressive Emerald opening here must be answered. And after a follow-up Prince John, suddenly challenging those threats is incredibly punishing. Add Ursula Deceiver of All to the mix and she simply adds to the pain by double singing Sudden Chill. Of course, she can also control the board with a double cast of Storm or Strength, and the result is often crippling. Additional steel cards like Mr. Smee support this opening further, and Binge's item control adds even more utility. All of these early game cards make up the mandatory core of this deck, but all the following characters are powerful as well, although a lot more flexible. When it comes to the four cost characters plus Tragic Beast, you could include whichever you like best or cut some of these all together based on your preference. But running a chunk of four cost characters is still important for following up your early game and for running two to three copies of Then Along Came Zeus, which I find to be quite impactful, especially during matches where you find yourself playing from behind. There are plenty of options though, including the Robin Hood line for another one drop that doubles as a shift threat. Other defensive actions from Steel like Fire the Cannons or Rise of the Titans can certainly work great in this deck as well. If you like the idea of a high risk, high reward deck list, and you're not afraid to go to the dark side and play a bit toxic, give this Emerald Steel discard deck a try. Moving on now to our third Steel list, we have Sapphire Steel, with a deck I like to call a whole new dime. This is our classic whole new world ramp deck that wants to combo into a high ink finisher with Bell, supported by all the steel actions as you'd expect. Set three of course brought Lucky Dime to the table, so now this deck has even more finishing power to cap off its combos, especially when paired with Tamatoa. I've always loved this deck for its high skill ceiling, but that also comes with a higher than usual skill floor, making it a bit more complicated to pilot. But once mastered, this deck is very strong indeed. In addition to the anti-aggro tendencies of Steel, as you might expect, Sapphire Steel in particular has long solidified itself as the top of the Steel food chain. By that, I just mean the Amber Steel and Emerald Steel decks that we just looked at, plus Amethyst Steel, all really struggle to keep up with the Sapphire Steel pairing. Not only does the Sapphire Ramp help get this deck ahead on the curve, but the unsung hero of Cogsworth really shuts down any attempts from rival Steel decks to fight back. And if two Cogsworth are on the field, it's pretty much game over. Cogsworth also helps in other matchups though, as he's the safest choice to send out in preparation for singing a whole new world, as his ward keyword keeps him nice and protected from any targeted threats. In addition, spreading resist around can really complicate things for your opponent. One quick example is how resist plus one on Hiram suddenly makes him safe from a single hit from Maui, a very nice bonus indeed. My deck list here includes a couple copies of Mr. Smee's as an early flex option, but often a turn to one jump ahead or even a Bob Boom will help get this deck's game plan rolling. Don't underestimate those small spells like Bob Boom or Fire the Cannons in this list. With so much ink and the intention to empty your hand before playing a whole new world, this deck can easily resort to a semi spell slinging playstyle to deal with the opposing board. In terms of weaknesses, this deck can certainly falter if you can't find all of those combo lines, and the lucky dime battle between red, blue, and blue steel is a fierce one, with Ruby able to take down sapphire steel threats much easier and generally able to out control over time. Sapphire steel does need to close out games quickly to make an impact in that face off against red, blue, but if you can find the right cards quickly, this deck is very powerful even in that tough matchup. As for final deck options, a lot of players prefer to run Tragic Beast over Giant Tank, but I think that's a bit unnecessary considering the power of the Tank plus Grab Your Sword combo at 6 ink. That extra card draw potential from Beast is nice, but not all that vital. Ideally, you have plenty of card draw from a whole new world with Flaversham items as a backup plan. Plus, Beast is simply too easy of a target for Madame Medusa. If you really want more card draw in this deck, consider a couple copies of Gaston. He's a great target for Lucky Dime, but even he feels a bit clunky in this deck, as it aims to combo very quickly with a whole new world, sort of ignoring everything else in favor of that powerful and focused game plan. Another quick final note is that I see a lot of players running Benja in this list, but it's super simple to swap him out for Judy Hops, who fulfills an almost identical role, but allows you to draw off your own items if you need to in a pinch. 
Trust me, that flexibility might just win you a game or two. Anyways, definitely consider playing this Sapphire Steel Dime list if you're looking for a skillful combo deck to pilot. Now let's return back to Emerald here to talk about Amethyst Emerald. I have two Emerald Bounce decks to discuss, a more mid-range leaning tempo list and a more aggressive list that you may have seen me cover already in a recent video. First up, this tempo list thrives off the simple core combo of Ursula Deceiver of All, double singing friends on the other side, and Mother Knows Best. Combine that value with the early game flexibility of Emerald plus Amethyst, and magic starts to happen. What I mean by that is you have the great offensive lore characters with Merfolk and Flynn Rider in Emerald, but also the defensive Rafiki into Pinocchio or even Mim Snake in Amethyst. Follow all of that up with even more disruptive characters like Ursula Deceiver, Madame M. Fox, Merlin Crab, and Kit Cloudkicker, and you have quite the flexible tempo deck here. I also include the great turn for Emerald Tinkerbell, which is extremely underrated. When played, she grants evasive to one of your previously played characters like Snake or Fox, allowing them to challenge in and counter your opponent's evasives. And if that's not enough, remember this is a bounce deck, so all these characters can leave and re-enter play to activate their abilities once more. Plus the Amethyst and Emerald pairing gives us access to Yzma and Genie to round out this list. This is a very strong deck list that has the ability to disrupt other big decks, and although this first version is likely the one everyone's going to be running, there are some very strong alternatives such as slotting in an additional discard package or leaning heavily into a more aggressive list altogether like shown here. This version of the deck utilizes Maleficent biding her time, Pinocchio star attraction, and more to really turn up the lore pressure. If you're curious about the details of this powerful aggro version of Amethyst Emerald, check out the video I put up last week covering all of the details. All right, let's move on to another one of our underdog picks, an ink combo that I think is very underutilized and underrated at the moment, Amethyst Steel. And I have two different versions of Amethyst Steel to show off today. The first list is a more mid-range list, and in some ways this deck takes the best of the Amethyst Bounce package and simply combines it with the deadly action removal of Steel. Compared to Ruby Amethyst, which also combines Amethyst with a removal color, this pairing brings some powerful tools to the table as well. The duo of Madame Mim Snake plus Mr. Smee Bumbling Mate means you always have access to a strong 3-3 stat line on turn 2. This strong second turn is sandwiched between a turn 1 hook opening, which can support Smee or combo with a turn 2 Pinocchio. After all this, you have a turn 3 Fox Rush, or follow up into damage from Baboom and Storm, and suddenly it's clear why this deck has such a threatening defensive early game. In addition to all that, Steel adds Benja to the mix as always, bringing crucial item removal to this deck. And remember, Benja paired with Amethyst can always be bounced back and replayed to recycle that item destruction ability. On the top end, there are several options like Sad Beast for card draw, or even Elsa Spirit of Winter for stalling the opponent later on. But I really like Yzma, Scary Beyond All Reason, who is pretty flexible at filling both roles as needed, although you could certainly mix in all three in different ways. Finally, I like to round out this list with one spell book and three castles to diversify the lore threats of this deck some. I even think pushing to two spell books can be really effective, especially in the Ruby Amethyst matchup. As for other options, I mentioned Beast and Elsa, but don't neglect to consider grab your sword, especially if you suspect go wide aggro decks to appear. Tinkerbell Giant Fairy is another great choice in that regard, and Rise of the Titans has to be mentioned as a tech card against both items and locations. Considering all this, it's incredible just how many options the purple steel pairing can unlock. Now let's shift gears slightly because I think this ink pairing has even more to offer, as it can thrive even outside of this mid-range playstyle. And no, I'm not talking about a Jafar list, although that is quite spicy and I do like it a lot. Instead, I want to showcase an aggro version of Amethyst Steel, as I really think it's worth taking a look at, especially for anyone looking for a deck with a nice surprise factor going into set championships or any upcoming event. At the one cost level, Captain Hook is swapped out for Chernabog's followers, Creatures of Evil. The idea here is to get some card draw in while you quest. No need for defense this time around, we're full speed ahead. And you can see that with the turn 1 Maleficent, as well as the Pinocchio swap, 
from Talkative Puppet into the Three Lore Star attraction. Plus, Pinocchio is joined by his partner in crime, Arthur, Wizard's Apprentice. After these strong, lore-heavy picks, you can protect them with the bodyguard duo of Hercules and the Prince. Other than that, we also add in Befuddle for even more protection for those early questers, and that includes Mr. Smee. You can always befuddle him back to hand to reset his damage and keep him safe. Another reason why Hook isn't quite as necessary in this particular list. I do think some action damage is still needed here though, so make sure you run at least a couple copies, if not more, of Storm, Strength, or Then Along Came Zeus. That's enough purple steel though, let's move on to another offbeat pick that I've personally been having a ton of success with. This is yet another Amethyst deck, this time Amethyst Sapphire. Now I won't go into a ton of detail here because this deck is actually the topic of my next deck guide. In fact, if you're watching this only a day or two after upload, my Amethyst Sapphire deck will already be out and I'll drop a link here on the video and below in the description. Regardless, the idea here is very similar to the other Amethyst decks like Ruby Amethyst or the mid-range Amethyst Steel deck we just saw. The difference with Sapphire is that ramping up to your later game characters like Yzma and Elsa is much easier. Now funny enough, I don't actually recommend a Fishbone Quill here or even one jump ahead, which is surprising especially considering their importance in the Ruby Sapphire deck. They're still good ramp picks to be sure, but the ability to bounce Detective Mickey in and out with Madame Mims is a unique component of this ink pairing. In addition, the turn to Gramatala as a ramp tool feels so natural when paired with Amethyst's Merlin Crab. In fact, using Crab to boost up Gramatala or Mickey is just so satisfying. You get so much value out of those lines. Mickey is also a great candidate for seeing friends on the other side. And of course, the goal here is to ramp straight up into an earlier than usual late game of spellbook lore and repeated board freezing with Elsa. Now there are a ton of different ideas for these ink colors, like the Fishbone Quill as I mentioned, but also Hades and Tamatoa are two strong picks that come to mind right away. But the final list I have here is what I've been really digging at the moment, and I encourage you to check out my full guide when it's out soon, as I explore a slight variation that simply runs four spellbooks and aims to steamroll opponents with that focused lore pressure. So make sure to check that out in a couple days when it's up. Moving on to our final list today, it just wouldn't feel right if I didn't mention one of my all-time favorite decks in this list, Amber Ruby Mufasa. Now don't get me wrong, this isn't included solely because I like the deck. I think Ruby Mufasa has always had potential in set 3, especially against a field full of control decks. You'll notice right away that I've cut all 1 drops from the list. This is a sign that hyper aggro decks aren't all too popular right now. So this Mufasa list can feel a bit safe simply inking on turn 1 before kicking into gear on turn 2. Now it's been a while since I've covered this deck on the channel, in fact we've had the entirety of set 3 to make some changes. Many Mufasa players love playing with Ruby Prince Eric or Amber Tinkerbell as their turn 4 options. Call me old fashioned, but I think Hades is still really putting in work here, especially against opposing Ruby decks. Some other departures from common lists would be that lack of the turn 1 queen line as I mentioned, both Regal Monarch on 1 and Commanding Presence on 5. These are solid cards of course, but not as necessary without many hyper aggro decks running amok. This means I can also cut teeth in Ambitions despite its synergy with Rapunzel, and cutting teeth also results in less of a need for the 1 cost mini mouse here. More unorthodox choices can be found at my 2 cost position. A lot of current lists love playing Sleepy here for the lore pressure, but if you're on the draw, poor Sleepy simply dies to the turn 2 Snakes or Smees which are all too popular, not to mention all the Hooks and Rafikis that also hit for 3 strength. Instead, I run 4 copies of Windy Darling, Talented Sailor. She comes out safely on turn 2, ready to quest for 2 lore on turn 3. But she's also a lot more effective compared to Sleepy when slammed in the late game, usually alongside a second character to prevent Tremaine from targeting them. My list also leans heavily into evasive characters, with Minnie, Goofy, and Tigger all making appearances. 
I think Evasive Pongo is a pretty solid choice too, but after a bit of testing, I like Tigger's resistance to Madame Medusa, but he's a nice play on turn 6 or turn 5 with Doc if you don't quite need to play out your removal ladies in red just yet. The biggest singular weakness of this deck, other than steel decks in general, is the dreaded Maui's Fish Hook, which excels at taking down all of our evasives here. So definitely keep that weakness, plus the anti aggro steel weaknesses, in mind. Overall, there's a surprisingly large pool of options for the Ruby Mufasa deck, despite it being pretty much an only character deck. In addition to Eric, Tink, and even Hydra, non character cards like Lantern and even B Prep are still decent inclusions. But if you want to play towards today's meta and have a shot at taking down a set championship with Mufasa, I think this list here is going to give you your best shot. Alright, well that concludes today's video. I've been working hard on this video and all these decks over the last few days and week, so I hope you guys enjoyed and got some use out of those deck lists. If you did, slam that be prepared down on that like button if you don't mind for me, and good luck at all your events this week and next weekend. Please let me know how it goes either down below or on Discord or Twitter, but until next time, peace.